Islam promoted intellectuality. Islam promoted critical thinking. Islam promoted research. Islam promoted the sciences from the inception. Our deen, our religion began with what? Iqra, recite. Our deen came with Rabbi zidni ilma. Oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. It's in our Quran 1400 years ago. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whomever practices medicine without being known to be skillful in medicine, then he is liable here in court and, and there in the hereafter meaning. Meaning medicine is not a game. Go and study it, become known for it, become skilled in it, then practice it. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allah did not send down a disease except that he sent down for it a cure. Whoever knows it, knows it and whoever doesn't, doesn't. Meaning go look for it. So the likes of this is what spearheaded Islamic civilization where their religion and their worldly life, they went hand in hand. And that's why you have, for example, in the 10th century, Avicenna, Ibn Sina, who as William Osler says, the Qanun, the canon of Ibn Sina, was the medical library in Europe for longer than any other book in history. In the 9th century, you have Al-Khawarizmi, the father of algebra. The Columbia history of the world says that modern trigonometry, algebra, and geometry are in considerable measure Arab creations. They mean Muslim creations. The 10th century, Al-Hazan, you may not know there's a crater on the moon that they call Al-Hazan. It was named after Al-Hazan, meaning Al-Hassan ibn Haytham, who died in 965, common era. Why was it named after him? Because of his contributions to optics and his discussions on luminosity. And he vanguarded, he started the discussions on the experimental method. 300 years later, 1295, Roger Bacon, who we learn in school as kids, is the father of the scientific method. He would quote and depend on and adore the writings of Al-Hassan ibn Haytham to be the father of the scientific method. The House of Wisdom, Baytul Hikmah in Baghdad, centuries ago, that was the world's largest repository of books. No one valued books the way we did. And that's why even when the Mongols attacked the Muslims and they took over, they said, what is this? They burned down the library and they took the books and threw them in the Euphrates River to such a degree that you could not drink from the river for days because of how much ink contaminated the river. That's how many books were there. There were more books in the street of Baghdad than there existed in cities in Europe. And then there's Cordoba. What do you know about Cordoba? Cordoba is Muslim Spain, Southern Spain. Just to give you a snapshot of what it looked like in the 10th century. And if you want to cry, cry, but not for pessimism. 28 boroughs, 10th century, 1,000 years ago, 3,000 mosques, 18,000 cities, 500,000 properties, meaning a house with the front and the back and the fencing and the properties. Number one was Baghdad, 3 million. Number two was Cordoba, 500,000. And number three was Seville, another city in Muslim Spain, 400,000. Qurtuba was known as the jewel of the world. People would go there for vacation just to see the union in Cordoba, to see the Grand Mosque in Qurtuba, the great bridge of Qurtuba. Markets galore. Can you imagine markets? for flowers, other entire markets for rare flowers, markets for fruits and vegetables, markets for rare animals, markets for all different kinds of paper, all of this and then the streets. The streets of Qurtuba, can you imagine this Islamic civilization in the 10th century was paved in stone. In Qurtuba, the streets had street lights in the 10th century. You know, there's a famous letter even speaking of the University of Qurtuba and the Umayyad University as well, from the English king of the time to Hisham ibn Abdul Rahman, who was the governor of Qurtuba at the time, asking him permission, the king, that his daughter and the members from the royal court can go study in the University of Cordoba. You know what that means? That means, number one, that this was an intellectual hub in the planet. And number two, that we were the ones that taught the world tolerance. He knew that the king's daughter could be safe there. And the letter was signed, as the historians mention, your loyal subject, the king of England. And that's why Gustave Le Bon, who you may study in psychology, in college perhaps, in university, the French social psychologist, he said, if only the Muslims would have conquered Paris as well. This is a non-Muslim saying this. He said, because if they would have, it would have been like Cordoba. He says, for 600 years, we depended on the Muslims to translate for us Greek philosophy. He says, and you walk through the streets of Cordoba, you find that the people can read and they can write, and some of them even know poetry. In an age when the kings and princes of Europe could not spell their names in their own languages. The first Islamic hospital in the world was in Damascus, Syria. 700 years meaning before Paris had its first hospital, Cordoba had 50 hospitals. All this is what, why am I mentioning all this? 
This is just a testimony that Islam can and has always built industries and individuals, has been able to maintain economies and ethics. Islam can and has balanced between materialism, this dunya, and spirituality, the spirit, and the religion. Islam can and has ensured prosperity and happiness and peace in this world and salvation in the hereafter.